Okay, so it's time to introduce our first speaker. And this is a food obsessed young man, well, he's young according to me, who started his business after meeting a complete stranger in the jungles of South India in 2010, who also shared a love of food, travel and meeting people. Three years later, the duo launched Grub Club, which is a foodie business, no surprise there, which connects chefs from Sierra Leone to Peru with a variety of quirky London venues, which I believe includes disused tube trains to taxidermy adorned Italian eateries. Now partnering with iconic brands for events, just how has Sid managed to achieve such success so quickly? Well, let's find out. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to try and pronounce his name properly. Please give a very warm welcome to the co-founder of Gob Club. Yes, it's Siddharth Vijaya Kumar. Thank you for the warm, warm welcome, guys. Um, so today I want to tell you a story. Um, I want to tell you how we went from one hungry diner me to over 51,000 diners um, over the last few years. And through telling that story, oop, almost gave it all away. And through telling that, that story, um, I hope to be able to share with you what I've learned over the last three years that will hopefully help you um, um, take some of your ideas to fruition. So as all good stories start, it begins in Zanzibar. Uh, back in 2006, uh, like this young lady said, I am, I am quite old. Uh, I was traveling around Kenya and Zanzibar. Um, and while I was out there, I, was, I, I came upon a restaurant called Two Tables. And the reason why it was called that was because it was um, two tables in someone's house. And I was really inspired by that idea, this idea that someone can set up a restaurant anywhere. Um, and the reason why was because I love this idea that someone can set up a restaurant and connect you with, in, with travelers looking for something different to a restaurant. So I was determined at that time when I returned to London uh, to set up a company that did just that. Um, and I knew straight away, like probably many of you here, that you might need a little bit of money uh, to do it. So I spoke to a whole variety of investors, uh, many with diverse backgrounds, uh, and they all were united with one thought, that I was a complete Muppet. They were like, you know what, no one's ever going to eat in someone's house. It's just the most ridiculous thing. Um, and you know what, they were right to some extent, actually. I think timing is so important. Uh, you may have a really good idea, but you need to do it at the right time. Uh, and let me try to paint you a picture of what 2006 looked like. So there's still something called the Social Networking Awards. Um, the, this horrendous website called MySpace won it back then. And the two sites tipped for success uh, in, two, in 2007 were something called Bebo and another one called Facebook. And I think one of them did okay, I think. Um, and we were still two years away uh, from this little company uh, called Airbnb, obviously, and two years away from what became known as the, the sharing economy. Um, so dejected and demoted, I went back to my job in advertising. Uh, but I wasn't one of those cool guys like Don Draper, if any of you have seen it. I was the nerdy media guy at the, in, the back, in the back room. Uh, but this isn't a sad story, guys, because six years on, I, a chance encounter in a jungle in South India uh, introduced me to my friend and eventual co-founder, uh, Liv. And when I told her about the idea for Grub Club, she was inspired the same way I was all those years ago in Zanzibar. And that was the catalyst for setting it up. And one thing for you guys to think about is when you come to set up your company, you know what, it's such a long journey to go on. Sometimes it's, it's very rewarding, it's a lot of fun, but sometimes it's nice to have someone there with you to share the burden with, and also to bounce ideas, but mostly share the burden. Um, so what is Grub Club? I, mean, I won't bore you guys too much about it, but what Grub Club does is we, there are three elements to it. Uh, on one hand, we have in incredibly talented chefs, many of whom work in Michelin star restaurants. On the other, we have uh, lots of venues that have some spare inventory. So it could be a cafe that closes at 3 p.m., a pub that has a spare room, uh, a museum, or even the St. Pancras clock tower that's either there or there. Um, we bring them together to set up a restaurant for a night. Um, and then we then, and then diners come looking for something beyond a restaurant. And I think by bringing those three elements together, um, we create 
and also check your slides before it, it goes on there. <laughs> um, and I think by, um, by, by bringing those three ingredients together, uh, we create extraordinary experiences in curious corners. And I'm really proud to be able to tell you that. You know, we have over 51,000 diners uh, who've used our service. We've got, we work with over 500 chefs uh, in over 1,000 venues all over London. Um, and we've had some good feedback, um, you know, some great press coverage. And the, the Guardian called us the Airbnb for supper clubs. Um, you know, the, um, we had business insiders say we were on course to make a billion dollars. I'm not sure about that, but, you know, our investors seem to like that. So I go with it. Um, but the thing that inspires me the most is what UCL said. Uh, they said that we were one of 10 companies that will change the world. And I think the reason why they said that was because, um, you know, we've, we've done something that's, we've changed something in, Lon in London, actually. You know, we've got chefs leave Michelin star restaurants to work with us full time because of the creativity and flexibility it offers. Uh, we've had venues stay open because of the incremental revenue we drive. Um, and it's those stories that inspire me to get up every day to go into work. Uh, and I think it's so important to have, you know, to, to know why you're doing something. You know, if you don't have that why, I think it's really difficult to sustain the, the long journey that's, that sometimes props up. So how do you go from spark to fire? Or in my case, beach bum to entrepreneur? Um, I think, uh, I'll, I'll try to tell you the story, I guess, in three parts. Uh, one, you know, some of you may be building tech or tech-enabled businesses, you know, websites and stuff. Some of you might not. Um, and if you are, I, I can talk to you a little bit of, about building that platform. Uh, how do you deliver those initial sales? I think that's important. Uh, and finally, adapting your business as you learn. Uh, setting up a platform is a complete nightmare. <laughs> you know, you'll make a lot of mistakes, but don't worry about it. Because no matter what option you take, if you take the one option of building an incredibly detailed, uh, you know, well thought through platform, you'll come to a set of issues at the end. And if you went for one that's cheap and cheerful, you will still come to those, uh, another set of problems at the end. So my advice to you is not to worry about it too much. Get on with it, build it, uh, and learn as you go. Um, and you know, not, don't be too hard on yourself. Um, the other thing I would say is that, you know, if, you know, if you're not fortunate enough to have someone technical, I know everyone thinks I'm a, I'm a techie because I'm Indian, but, you know, I'm actually the marketing guy in the business. <laughs> so if you don't have a techie like we do, um, then I would encourage you to outsource uh, a lot of that work and try to build it fairly cheaply uh, to begin with. Uh, don't, you know, overcomplicate or over-engineer a solution. Try to get product market fit um, and then move on from there. So how do you get those all important first sales? Um, this might sound obvious to a lot of you, but the first customer is your mom. Uh, that's my mom, and you can tell by the way she's looking at me so adoringly, she was definitely gonna buy whatever I sold her. You know, <laughs> so make sure you use your friends and family as much as possible. Um, and not just for, for, the, for the sales, but also uh, in terms of widening your network. Um, one useful thing that I learned is that actually people are inherently good. So if you tell them your idea, uh, they, they don't tell, tend to give you the kind of feedback that you need, that you find useful. So what I try to do is if I have an idea, I usually tell uh, one of my friends it's someone else's idea. And then they give me the feedback that's actually more, more appropriate and I can use it better, use that feedback a lot better. But I, li I like bad feedback though. Um, do you have any unfair advantages in your business? Um, so for us, we were quite lucky because we are a three-way marketplace, I guess, and because of that, uh, one of our chefs actually spent a lot of time driving our own customers. So before we launched, we spent about three to four months really getting out there and meeting as many chefs as possible uh, so that on the day that we launched, uh, we already had a whole uh, set of customers ready to go. So uh, we were lucky that within 10, 15 minutes, we had our first customers on the side of going live. Uh, and the same with the venues, you know, we're able to leverage that quite a bit in order to get them to drive sales. And finally, those early customers you get are so important because, you know, they'll help you find the next group of customers. Um, building alliances and partnerships are important. Um, you know, what I like to say here bef before I go into that, actually, I think that, you know, we live in an amazing world with, you know, lots of innovation and creativity and entrepreneurship. But I think that also creates a whole set of challenges um, because of it. Because you may have an idea in, in New York, and then that idea gets replicated in Dubai or 
India or wherever else within you know two or two or three months. Uh, so your idea itself is is, is quite commoditized. Um, design is, is incredibly commoditized. The technology platforms they're built on are incredibly com commoditized. You know, so how do you differentiate yourself in such a you know cluttered market? So I think that the only way you can do it is through having the right brand, the right tone of voice, because that's the only thing I be I believe that people can't replicate. You know, that authentic voice, and I think customers uh, see that straight away. Uh, but one thing that I like to do when, I, when we select our partners is to look at it across a spectrum, from the functional to the emotional. Um, on the functional side, you have people like London Pop-Ups, Just Open London, The Nudge, which are great sites that talk about going out in London, places to eat. So we've all, we worked with them to drive a lot of sales at the start. But we also looked at companies along the emo on the other side, towards the emotional side. Um, companies that where you have a set of shared values, belief systems. Uh, London Food Link is one of them. You know, they really care about food sustainability in London. And that's something really close to the heart uh, of Grub Club, and especially my co-founder. Uh, Airbnb is another one, you know, where we feel that there's a lot of shared ethos um, around building communities. And so I'm very proud to say that we worked with them for a few years um, on Christmas Day, where they gave us a flagship apartment. Uh, and we ran a Christmas Day grub club there for all the people in London who are away from their friends and family. So everyone brought a dish that sort of reminded them of their favorite Christmas. Uh, and it's really struck a chord with our, with our customer base. And also the press, thankfully. Um, and this is something to think about, I think. I think, you know, you guys are doing some amazing stuff, coming up with some amazing ideas. You know, people want to hear about it. The press want to hear about it because, you know what, they're looking for stuff to write about. Uh, you know, a lot of people tend to forget that. You know, we hassled as many people as we could from day one, uh, and we were quite lucky to get the coverage to get us moving because we haven't really spent any money on marketing, so we've had to find other ways to drive sales. Um, one of the things I would say is build relationships with the press from early on before you even launch. You know, let them become part of your story so that they start to support you post-launch. Uh, sounds incredibly obvious, but you know, make sure you have something to sell when you do launch. You know, like I've seen a lot of sites that go live and the press writes about them and they don't actually have any product to sell. So think about that. Uh, and then finally, I think spend time getting the right type of press, you know, the right type of targeted media that your consumers are reading. Uh, I think a lot of people who, who run tech-enabled businesses, I think they focus on working with, you know, trying to get into TechCrunch or trying to get into Mashable, which are great publications. But you have to wonder whether your users are reading them. Um, so we focus all of our attention on getting into Time Out or Evening Standard uh, because we knew that's what women 25 to 44 were reading. <laughs> um, and how do you create uh, PR-worthy stories? And I think what I would like to say at this point, actually, as well, is I think it's really important to think of stories that you really care about, that are close to your heart. Because if you try to do something that's more clickbaity, I think the press and your customers will see it. You know, me personally, I love The Big Lebowski. It's one of my favorite films. Um, and so we did a dinner um, where we themed burgers with The Big Lebowski for an immersive experience with white Russians. White Russians, yes. And uh, we called it, obviously, The Pig Lebowski. Um, I've got loads of film funds, by the way, so just email me if you ever need one. Uh, and uh, my co-founder, Liv, just got a dog. So the next event we're doing is a dog's dinner. It's going to be a, a Michelin meal for you and Fido. So, you know, that's an example of another uh, event that you can do that might, might, may have some press, uh, that may garner some press coverage. <coughs> uh, and finally, uh, how do you adapt your business as you learn? I think when you, when you first start, I think it's, you know, you have a sort of childlike curiosity of everything that's going on. Um, you know, you don't really think about, you know, some of the, the boring numbers like average order value and CPAs and whatnot. But once you've been going for a couple of years, which we have, we've got a lot of data uh, that we need to look at, you know, and take a hard look at it and go, Ashley, does this data stack up against the business that we originally planned? Uh, and we went through that process and realized, actually, you know what? Uh, there are certain tweaks we can make. But at the same time, we have to stay true to what we're about, which is about creating extraordinary experiences. Uh, and that's why we launched a new product last year, uh, which is about, you know, you, uh, as a diner, you can come to us and you can 
pick a chef, choose a venue, and create your own restaurant for the night, which you know I'm, I think is a really powerful idea, and I'm really excited by it. Uh, so in conclusion, um, what I'll say is that uh, I think timing is really important, uh, you know, the, almost as important as the idea itself. Um, I also think that, you know, something that you should think about at the start before you even get, before you even launch it is to think that, you know, can you build the kind of life that you want with the business that you have? Because it's going to be a long journey. Oops. I'll move back. Uh, it's going to be a long journey, so you, you should really choose something that you love and you can care about that's going to inspire you to wake up and go to work every day. Uh, and that, I think, reflects into the brand that you build, uh, because I don't think anyone can be the better uh, version of yourself than you. So, and that translates into the company as well. Uh, and that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sid. Now, I know you called yourself a beach bum, but actually yeah. you've had a very successful career in the past in online advertising. So I'm just wondering how that background actually helped you build your brand Grub Club. Was it easier to build your own brand yes. than it was to work on other customers' accounts? Yes, I think, I think for sure. I think uh, one of my colleagues in, in, from my media days is sitting back there. Um, yeah, I think it was a lot easier. So my, my background is not in branding and communications. My background is more in, in acquisition of customers. So it really helped um, with uh, getting launching the business and getting those f initial customers because you, you take a more sort of um, a data-driven approach to driving those sales. Uh, and that was really useful for me. Um, but I think as we've grown, I've come to realize actually, you know, branding is super important. Uh, and I think, you know, marketing is such a wide spectrum that no one is ever going to know all of the aspects of marketing, you know, like pricing, like product development, branding, communications, like customer acquisition. Uh, so it's important to break down uh, the, the skills that you have and go and reach out and go and get the ones that you are missing. And so we've, we've done that quite a bit. And you said you didn't have much of a budget for marketing. Is that still the case now? Because obviously Grub Club has grown really popular. Have you decided to keep it lean because it worked well for you in the early days? Yes, uh, we, we still don't have any marketing budget right now. We haven't spent, I think we've spent over the last three years about £10,000 on marketing. So Just it's all using been, pets of your friends yes, and family. Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Trying to come up with new ideas. Yeah. Um, but I think uh, now we've just about closed a round of funding, and so we're going to start uh, spending money, which I'm very excited by, because that's, that's what I've, I used to do in the past. So, so you've done all, everything on £10,000 yeah. per year? No, in, 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 total. in total, yeah. Over three years, uh, wow. But I think it's, it's really, I, I actually think it's super important sometimes not to have any money, because you start to learn what the, the, the sort of drivers are for a sale. So I think if I had a lot of money, um, which, which I did in the past because we used to deploy like a million pounds of budget a month. Um, you sort of like just chuck it out there and sort of hope that, you know, you'll optimize it and improve your conversion rates over time. But when you know what the drivers are for sale, like I've learned over the last three years, you can be more targeted with how you approach the problem uh, and hopefully not spend as much. Well, Sid, thank you very much. You'll be yes. able to ask Sid a question later on. But in the meantime, Sid, everybody. Thank you, Sid. Thank you. Thank you.